Good afternoon. Are we all set? Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Erie County update for October 21st of uh, 2020, another COVID-19 update. Uh, we'll be talking primarily about COVID-19 today, unlike last week where we talked about the budget and COVID-19. The information uh, as presented is as accurate as when it was put into the presentation approximately uh, 40 minutes ago, last uh, revised. Uh, there were, as of the end of day yesterday, 12,485 total COVID-19 uh, positive cases in uh, Erie County since the beginning of the outbreak. That is out of more than half a million tests that have been conducted. Uh, so if you remember where we were in the beginning, where it was very difficult to get testing material, uh, now we've done more than half a million specimens and 12,485 total positive cases. These are not duplicates. These are individualized cases. Uh, 713 people have died. Unfortunately, that's five since uh, a one, a little bit about one week ago, uh, October 14th, uh, including uh, two individuals who died in the hospital on October 19th, which is the first uh, number of individuals who've actually died in the hospital from COVID-19 in more than a week. These are, of course, all lab-confirmed cases prior to uh, their death. So these are not post-mortem uh, determinations that they had COVID-19, and there are no presumed positives. Uh, on October 21st, there were 47 individuals admitted to Erie County hospitals for COVID-19. 11 individuals are in the ICU. Seven individuals had an airway assist. Now, as we talk about this when it pertains to uh, Western New York, I've, talk, I've, I've spoken recently about what we consider to be an increasing amount of cases in the uh, other counties in Western New York. Now, Western New York, for the purpose of uh, this process here, is Niagara, Erie, Chautauqua, Cattaraugus, and Allegheny counties. Genesee, Wyoming, and Orleans are considered the Finger Lakes. They're not considered uh, Western New York. So here's something that's probably a little surprising, is that on October 19th, 40% uh, of all hospitalized cases were outside of Erie County. It's the largest percentage that we've seen so far. There were 79 COVID-19 patients hospitalized on October 19th throughout all of Western New York, 13 in the ICU. As we said, 47 of those patients were in Erie County. Uh, the remaining 32 were in the other Western New York counties. Uh, conversation with the uh, uh, chairwoman of the Niagara County Legislature, Becky Wittish, two days ago on the 19th indicated they only had three patients in Niagara County. So these new, these other cases are coming from the southern portion, the rural portion. Uh, the governor did not identify uh, Chautauqua, Cattaraugus, or Allegheny as hotspots, but he did put Stu Bend County on the cluster list. And Chemung County is on the cluster list as well. So the southern counties of New York State certainly have uh, something not good going on when it pertains to COVID-19. Uh, so 60% of all the patients on October 19th in Western New York hospitals were in Erie County, 40% in the other counties. And as you see here, here's the graph for Erie County for the last two weeks. It's kind of gone up, down, but it's stayed within the, uh, within the either high 30s or low 40s numbers. Uh, unlike what we've seen in the other counties in which we've seen some pretty decent increases. And it, as I can remember, there's been no time since we started the pandemic where when we looked at Western New York hospitalizations, the counties outside of Erie County made up 40% of all hospitalizations. So that's concerning. Uh, and it is concerning for us because a conference call I had yesterday with leaders of the hospital systems uh, we, we were talking about was there any bleed over of individuals from those counties to our hospitals in Erie County. And we, I was told there were at least two patients that were in hospitals in Erie County that were residents of uh, the southern portions of Western New York. So I'm worried that the hospitals in the southern part of the county are going to start running out of beds and I see in, in, in with regards to uh, the total patients they have. Uh, that are COVID-19 positive and the non-COVID-19 positive cases. Uh, so there is something going on in the southern part of Western New York 
for that matter, the southern tier of all New York State. Uh, that is very concerning, such to the point that the governor puts Duben County on the yellow cluster list and Chemung County, I believe, on the, the orange and yellow cluster list just about an hour and a half ago. And uh, while we have not seen Chautauqua, Cattaraugus, or Allegheny added to those statewide cluster lists, something's going on in the southern part of the state that's not good. People need to wear a mask. They need to safely socially distance when possible. They need to wash their hands, especially if you've come in contact with something that uh, other people may have utilized. Uh, or, of course, use the hand sanitizer like we have here. So uh, just want to put it out there once again that uh, COVID-19 can hit you no matter where you are, urban, suburban, or rural. And as you've seen across the country, there's big upticks in rural areas across the country, and we're seeing uh, increases in the rural areas in New York State as well. Uh, COVID-19 cases by gender and residence as of October 19th. This really hasn't changed too much recently. Uh, male make up 45%, female 55% of the COVID-19 cases. Uh, the city of Buffalo makes up 47% of the uh, cases uh, as compared to its population only being about 28% of the overall county. And uh, the uh, areas outside the city of Buffalo make up 53% of the cases, which once again is a lower amount than what the actual population of the county is. Uh, these numbers really haven't changed a whole lot recently. Uh, cases by age and gender, you've seen this uh, for a while there. It was a pretty even amount in the uh, age categories, but we saw starting about a month and a half ago a big increase in the 20 to 29 year old. And for that matter, even the 15 and 19 year olds, and, and that continues, uh, where now the, the two largest age categories for COVID-19 positive cases are those in the 20 to 29 and those in the 30 to 39. So school or prime working age. Uh, COVID-19 cases by age groups. This is for the week ending of October 17th. Uh, there was a decrease in the proportion of cases in the zero to 19 age group. That's a good thing, 5% uh, decrease, but there's also 5% increase from the week before in the 20 to 29 year uh, age group. So uh, for the week ending on uh, October 17th, there were 323 positive cases, which is actually good because it was a drop from the week before, but uh, 20 to 29 year olds made up uh, more than a quarter of them and as you can see, the numbers for the older age categories have dramatically dropped from earlier in the year. Once again, I just believe the older age categories are, are following the rules more. They're not going out to dinners. They're not going out to various occasions. They're wearing their masks because they understand that the older you are, the greater risk you are of getting very sick or dying of COVID-19. Uh, this is something that we've been looking at, especially as the state's been taking an, uh, a hard look at clusters by zip codes. So uh, these are the top 10 zip codes by positivity rates as of the week ending October 17th. Uh, and you'll see there has been a nice drop compared to a couple weeks before. The number one zip code for the week ending on uh, the last three weeks actually is the 14214 zip code, which is the university area of the city of Buffalo. University of Buffalo and just a, uh, northeast, so to speak, of uh, Canisius College. So two weeks ago, the tests that were being done in the 14214 area code, or not area code, zip code, came back 7% positive. The week ending October 10th, they came back 5.7% positive. And the week ending last week, they came back 3.2% positive. I mean, this is why for a while now I've been talking about zip code or areas and areas of concern. Uh, so we, uh, we, we were getting to a point there where the, that zip code was potentially going to be one of those cluster zones that the governor talks about, but thankfully we've seen a drop in the last few weeks. Uh, if there's a star associated with it, uh, that means that for whatever particular week, it was less than 1% uh, in, in the total numbers that were tested positive, uh, or there actually may not have been anyone tested positive or in that zip code. Uh, but you'll see for the top 10 for the week ending the 17th, uh, you're looking at the city of Buffalo, the city of Buffalo, the city of Buffalo, Amherst, the city of Buffalo, the city of Buffalo, the city of Buffalo, Lackawanna, city of Buffalo, East Aurora. East Aurora, or Aurora actually, but primarily East Aurora. Uh, there was a, a fairly, I wouldn't say significant increase in the number of cases, but there were uh, uh, clusters of uh, cases associated with three families in East Aurora. So it was not as if there was a big outbreak associated with any one particular work location, but we determined 
through our contact tracing that East Aurora, which previously had hardly any cases the two weeks before, had jumped up into the top 10 percentage-wise, and it was re basically in relation to three families, which is we've seen this across the board. Father gets sick, mother gets sick, they take it home, the whole family gets sick. I mean, it's simple as that. Uh, but uh, I'm glad to see the positivity rates have been dropping. Uh, that's a good thing. We don't want to see that continue to rise like we've seen in other parts of the country or New York State. And that will be a way that we keep our community out of the uh, cluster zones that the governor's been looking at and been enacting stronger regulations for anyone that's in a cluster zone. Uh, I'll turn it over to the Dr. Burstein now as we talk about diagnostic tests, positivity rates, and the like. Uh, we're doing better for Erie County. We're not doing better as Western New York per se. Uh, and I think it's primarily because of issues associated with the counties in the southern part of Western New York. And I would ask anybody, regardless of where they live, if you live in Erie County in the city of Buffalo, or you live in Erie County in Sardinia or Collins, or you live in uh, Birdsall in Allegheny County, uh, you live uh, in uh, Jamestown in Chautauqua County, uh, Great Valley, all of Casadega, be, be aware that COVID's everywhere and wear a mask. Just because you're in a rural area doesn't mean you can't catch it. As we've seen, we're seeing increased hospitalizations uh, in the rural counties, uh, while our numbers aren't really that bad. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Burstein to talk more about our numbers, which aren't really that bad, especially the diagnostic testing results. Thanks. So, uh, oops. Good afternoon. No, that's okay. I'm on. <laughs> I won't fall. So, um, so these data are looking at the uh, the total number of tests, which are in the blue and yellow bars, and then the proportion of positive tests, which is in the black line. And so you can see that our, our numbers are continuing to decrease. Um, and we will, we still have a robust number of people every week getting tested. So this past week, we actually saw a decline in the proportion of people who tested positive for COVID-19 at just 1.2%. So, uh, you know, that's down from the previous week of 1.5%. So we're heading in the right direction. We're very happy about that. Um, looking at antibody testing, we are still doing antibody testing in Erie County. Um, obviously, looking at the, um, the total number of tests that are being done every week in the second column, you can see that the interest among uh, our Erie County residents in getting an antibody test has declined, where we're having smaller numbers tested. And, um, and so lately, the proportion of positives have, have been a little bit higher, and I think that's an artifact that we're seeing, we're probably seeing um, people who really have been infected or thought they had been infected coming in to see if they really were infected. So um, overall, our county's uh, positivity rate for antibodies is about 7%. So there are the bottom line is there are still a lot of people in Erie County who are susceptible to a COVID-19 infection, and that's why it's really important to uh, still um, include our preventive behaviors in our daily lives. So now we're turning to our mortality data, which is again very sad. And you know the demographics haven't changed. Uh, I think we only added, um, you know, five more, five additional um, mortalities to our numbers this past week. You can see the vast majority of our victims of COVID-19 are our seniors, um, especially people over the ages of, se of 70 and 80 years old. And those are a higher proportion of females compared to males. Uh, then uh, looking at, uh, at testing, so Erie County is still forging ahead with diagnostic testing and antibody testing. So to get either test, uh, you could call the same number at 716-858-2929 to schedule. Uh, there is uh, um, no cost. Uh, there is, uh, you don't need to show any insurance. Uh, you don't need any type of lab requisition or doctor's order. Um, and these clinics are being done uh, through, um, through Erie County Department of Health. We have our EMTs collecting specimens and our public health lab is running the reverse transcriptase PCR, which is the most sensitive test for COVID-19. So remember, these are by appointment only. You have to call for an appointment. Uh, if you want a diagnostic test, you can go on our website at erie.gov slash COVID test to uh, schedule your online antibody test or you can just walk in for the antibody test. Um, but if you make an appointment, please show up because these are a hot commodity. 
Um, for our diagnostic testing, our reverse transcriptase PCRs, um, we're still doing those uh, three times a week on Mondays in Williamsville, uh, Wednesdays in Orchard Park, and Thursdays in Buffalo. And now we have, uh, because of a generous um, gift from the, or a loan from the New York State Department of Health, we have a point of care uh, molecular diagnostic test or rapid test called the Abbott ID Now, which I talked about in a previous press conference, where the test results are available in 15 minutes after the specimen is collected. So we are offering these tests um, just for people who are in school, whether staff or students. I think they'll get about, I'll get into that a little bit more, but Monday, every day um, during the weekday, Monday through Friday, when schools are open. Um, and then we're still offering antibody testing just down to once a week. And so we're going to be in Concord Senior Center in Springville next week. So for our uh, point of care testing, again, these are really for symptomatic students or symptomatic school staff where there are in-person classrooms, so people are going, have the opportunity to go into the school to learn or to teach, and they develop symptoms, and so then they are excluded from school until we know if it's COVID-19 or not that is causing their symptoms. And this is for uh, the pre-K to through grade 12. And so um, these are appointment only. Again, you call 858-2929. Um, also, we don't want people who are already in quarantine to get tested because you have to stay out for 14 days regardless of what your test results are. So we encourage people in quarantine to get tested. However, we recommend they get like a regular uh, PCR test or uh, another, uh, either from us or uh, another clinic. Um, we are in three locations, um, Monday through Friday at the north, um, in the northern suburbs, in, in central Erie County, and in the southern suburbs. Uh, and so, again, if you want to schedule, 858-2929. And so this is going on a first-come, first-serve basis. Um, and if people can't get in when they want to get in, um, they can always make an appointment for our regular diagnostic testing. So these are a hot commodity. New York State has been super generous. Uh, they, we have uh, 10 machines, and we've expanded our hours, so we're doing everything we can to ensure that as many people in Erie County who, who want to get back into the school can get back into the school. We also have information about other tests available in Erie County on our Erie County COVID test site map. Uh, so each uh, star, or if you go actually to the website, there are little dots uh, correspond to a site that is uh, testing or collecting specimens. So if you click on that dot, it will tell you all, a little window will pop up and it will tell you everything about the site, what the type of tests that are offered, uh, if you have to pay out of pocket, uh, pay insurance, the hours available, and, um, and pharmacies are included in this information too. Um, and then if people have concerns about uh, any type of event um, uh, or any uh, restaurant or bar that is non-compliant with executive orders, uh, they can give us a call at a health department at 716-961-6800 or go to our website at erie.gov health and file a complaint. Or um, you can file the complaint with the New York State Compliance Line at 833-208-4160, or you can text them at 855-904-5036. Um, you can, um, you know, lodge complaints uh, not only about, you know, uh, restaurants, um, but any any type of business, um, either to us or to the, um, we would forward that to New York State, to New York PAWS, or um, either by their phone number or online, or you can um, contact your local municipality if, uh, if you have a concern. So uh, um, the governor did expand the travel advisory. I think there are 43 states now on the travel advisory. So um, we're, uh, when we're also landlocked because all the states around New York State are on the travel advisory, and, um, and you know, including uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio. So that might be one of the reasons some of the southern states have a little higher numbers because they're so close to those borders where they're, we, they see a very high prevalence. So, um, so the, um, the, the bad news 
uses that our, our adjacent states are on the on the uh, list where we, there is a travel advisory. The good news is that uh, the you know the governor's office is being realistic about travel. You know there are many people you know especially in the southern tier and uh, in downstate that um, li you know live in one of these states and then work in New York State or or vice versa. I have to go back and forth every day. So the governor is not uh, in, you know enforcing a, a quarantine, but just advising that you know people really try hard to uh, to refrain from um, any type of non-essential travel to those states. So if you have to go there for work or come in and out for work or um, um, you know some other essential business, uh, that's okay. But um, you know please um, you know don't take a holiday in one of those states. So um, uh, Erie County also is reviewing uh, complaints either by phone or from our online travel forum and uh, following up for those. And then again, um, you know, people coming in from um, from Canada, if they're driving through, um, they're not, and for essential business, like they're working, they're not gonna be subject to any quarantine. However, if they're flying, they will still be subject to the same restrictions as, as any other foreign country. So uh, now the county executive will talk about how we are responding in Erie County. Thank you, Dr. Burstein. Uh, and I would note with regards to the Canadian travel, of course, the Canadian government just extended the basically ban on travel uh, for an additional period. Uh, I've been talking with our partners in Washington, D.C and the hope that that would allow at least some cross-border traffic here, especially among those of a family, uh, but may not be considered essential, and that unfortunately was not approved. Uh, the Canadian government has made a determination based on the increasing numbers in the United States. In some ways I can't blame them when you see what's going on across the rest of the country. With, uh, in Wisconsin, they've already run out of hospital beds. Uh, increasing numbers in Iowa and Kansas, it's not pretty, let's put it that way. Livel Erie Cares Act child care funding program, $7 million in child care subsidy assistance was put aside. This does not include a couple of the other programs that we have. Many families are not are not applying that qualify. We want you to know you must apply soon. You've got to apply at least by the end of this month. 716-858-8953 uh, is uh, the phone number you can call to get to our daycare, child care uh, department, or just go to www2.erie.com dot gov slash social social services uh, for more information on that we want everyone who qualifies and needs child care assistance to receive it uh, as a result we also have Erie County virtual learning center some of them have just come online in the last week it's open to every kindergarten through eighth grade student and there are locations in every Erie County school district there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to take advantage of the virtual learning centers if you need them they're offered at no cost for those at or below the New York State median income, which for a family of four is over $80,000 a year. Uh, if they're greater than the, uh, the uh, income threshold, you can call us at 877-6666 and we'll try to help you one way or another. Uh, but we want more people to take advantage of the virtual learning centers. Uh, some of them are just opened in the last week, so we're waiting to see another week or so. But uh, Right now, it's about 25% capacity is what we're seeing. So we could probably get many more children in these virtual learning centers. It's just a matter of the parents knowing about them. Uh, the Live Well Erie Cares Act Rental and Mortgage Assistance Program. We have $10 million that has been set aside, put available. Have some st specifics as of last Friday. Uh, more than 1,100 individuals have applied. 1,057 have applied for rental assistance, seeking $2.3 million. Only 102 applied for mortgage assistance, seeking 87,000. We now we fully expect the rental number to go up. We're not so certain about the mortgage assistance. We're, we knew it was going to be smaller, but we were a little surprised at how small it was. Uh, a lot of people qualify, including once again those at the median income for New York State, which means if you're a family of four, you can qualify even if you make $80,000 a year, uh, and you can get uh, a significant assistance to help uh, avoid an eviction or a foreclosure, uh, call 211 for more information, or you can go online to 211wny.org. Uh, so uh, people, please take advantage of these programs. Uh, otherwise, the money's gonna get moved somewhere else because the Erie County Back to Business Grant Program, which we announced a little over a week ago, has already had 
As of the 19th, 1,556 small businesses apply, seeking $27,735,000. We only have $20 million set aside. Now, some of those businesses might not qualify, so there's a possibility that they may not qualify because of the program restrictions. Uh, but if you are a sole proprietor, you could qualify up to $10,000. If you have between two and 25 employees, you could qualify up to $25,000. If you have between 26 to 50 employees, you could qualify up to $45,000 in grant. I'm glad to see our small businesses are applying for the program. Uh, but as you see, they've, we've already had more applications and dollars requested than we have set aside. Uh, we are considering adding to the program, but that might meet, require us to take from elsewhere because it's not like I have a big pot of money elsewhere sitting around. So if we do not see the rental assistance program generating the amount of money that we set aside for it, uh, we are going to transfer it to the back to business grant program. Uh, so it's only been a little over a week and we've had uh, more than 1500 apply. You must apply by November 2nd. No money is out the door. No determinations are gonna be made until November 2nd. So we're gonna get all the applications in, determine what we have, base it off of that, so by November 2nd, we're going to be making a determination with regards to whether we move funds from maybe the uh, child care or the uh, rental and uh, mortgage assistance program to the back to business grant program, as we certainly want to help our local economy. Uh, and I want to thank our partners at 43 North and the Amherst Chamber of Commerce who played a great role. Uh, but starting November 2nd, uh, or I should say on November 2nd, so starting on November 3rd, which I think everyone knows is a real big day, <laughs> uh, we, will, we will then be reviewing the applications and making determinations thereafter. Uh, and once again, the Back to Business Grant Program, uh, go to back to biz, B -I -Z, grants org for more imp information and to apply. And do it ASAP. Because if somebody's calling on November 3rd saying, hey, I just found out about it, it's going to be too late because we already know we've had so many, so many businesses apply and the dollar values are so high that we're not going to be able to make any adjustments for those who don't apply uh, on time. And considering all the advertisements we're doing and the information about this, I don't know how you wouldn't have learned about it by now. <laughs> uh, I'll turn it over to the doctor to talk about the final things and I'll come up to say a few final words before we'll take some questions. Big day this Saturday. It's an important one, especially as it pertains to the uh, opiate issues. Thank you. So, uh, you know, we are still continuing to struggle with our opioid epidemic throughout the county. And one big prevention tool that we have are disposing of unused medications. So this could be prescription medications, over-the-counter medications, expired, uh, unexpired, uh, you know, whatever you're not using. If it's in your medicine cabinet, you're not using it, you don't need it, and it may fall into uh, hands that, that shouldn't be touching them. So please participate in our drug drop-off day on Saturday, October 24th. So there'll be drop-off sites throughout Erie County, so please take advantage of it. And uh, if you miss that, we have drug drop-off kiosks uh, throughout Erie County uh, that are uh, anonymous. You just uh, stick them in and they look exactly like a mailbox. So please take advantage of this opportunity. And uh, if you miss it for any reason, uh, you know, please take advantage of the opportunities that we offer 24-7 in Erie County. So this opportunity on Saturday Saturday is going to be uh, run by uh, the DEA and it'll be open from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So please participate. Um, another haunting question that I've had is uh, what to do about Halloween. So uh, that's at the end of the month for many people. It's their favorite holidays. So um, each individual municipality is going to be handling uh, trick-or-treating activities uh, differently. The city of Buffalo, for example, recommends that city residents find some type of alternative activities to trick-or-treating on October 31st. And uh, they have that information and recommendations on their website listed. Um, there are uh, lots of alternatives to trick-or-treating, which I think are in my next slide. Um, and also, um, still the kids want to dress up, and they should dress 
dress up and just have to think about still costume safety. Um, and then when uh, kids are walking around at night looking at the beautifully uh, decorated houses, you know, still think about you know, safety. And if you're driving around, you know, think about kids running around in, um, in uh, like kind of black monster costumes that you might not see at night. And also, you know, remember about uh, um, counsel your kids about safety of, of candy. So the um, New York State Health Department just issued um, Halloween, alternative Halloween uh, guidelines or recommendations of things that you can do. Um, so there are a lot of fun things you can do instead of going door to door and collecting candy. So um, um, one of um, you can um, do activities in your house, like have uh, you know carving pumpkins or have a dress up contest or have like a little scavenger hunt in your house. Um, you can have a scavenger hunt in your uh, community, you know, list, write a list of things that you want your kids to spot, um, spot and they can just walk through the neighborhood in their costumes and, and um, you know, tick off that they saw them and then they can get a candy prize or something healthy prize. Uh, they, um, you can have, um, you know, drive through parades. So there are, a lot of, um, there are a lot of fun things that you can do. You don't have to go door to door and interface with someone in the public and then you know, have your kids like, um, you know, pick through the candies that everybody else has touched so they can get their favorite. So let's, um, you know, treat it, please try to reframe from that. There's still a lot of fun that people can have in Halloween without uh, going door to door. Also, um, it is the season for flu vaccine uh, in addition to Halloween. And so we really want to encourage everybody to get a flu vaccine, even if you've never had one before, this year is the year to get it. Uh, we already have a pandemic uh, that causes flu-like illness. And if uh, you can get infected with COVID-19 and influenza at the same time, and we do not want that to happen. Also, uh, for you know, people who want to stay in school or stay in work, um, if they develop uh, influenza, those are the same symptoms as COVID-19. And even if they have a mild case, they won't be able to go to work. So pharmacies are well stocked. Doctors' offices are well stocked. Um, uh, there are some other sites like uh, Wegmans um, and uh, you know, and senior centers that are offering flu vaccine clinics. Wegmans has um, has one coming up on uh, this um, October 24th at their Dick Road store in Tipu from 10 to 2. Um, Kaleida is offering flu clinics, um, and we are in Erie County. We're going to be offering flu clinics. We'll, we're just getting those um, finalized now. So please take advantage. Please get the flu vaccine. The nasal, for people who are needle phobic, the nasal vaccine is available for people that are eligible to between the age of two and uh, through the age of 49 years. So um, there are options. So please think about it. And you know, p again, people with egg allergies can get the immunizations. There are very, very few reasons for people under uh, people over the age of six months uh, not to get immunized. So with that, uh, we can entertain questions. Thank you, Doctor. First, I have, a, I have a couple of things to say. Uh, once again, I offer my deepest condolences to the families and loved ones of those who were lost. We've had five people who died of COVID-19 in Erie County during the last week and certainly don't want to forget them. Uh, I also want to offer my deepest condolences to the uh, Majority Leader of the New York State Assembly, Crystal People Stokes, who lost her daughter, Rashawn King, earlier this week. I do not believe it was COVID related. Rashawn had battled kidney issues and was a important member of the Erie County family. I worked for Erie County government for a long time. Unfortunately, she passed earlier this week. Uh, and I spoke to the majority leader yesterday on behalf of the people of Erie County offering my condolences as well as the Erie County team for losing a very important team member uh, who's worked in county government for quite some time. Uh, this has been a tough year for a lot of folks. I seem to have had more calls and condolence letters than I've dealt with even outside of the realm of COVID than any year before. And I just want everyone to remember we are all in this together. We all need to be our brothers and sisters keeper. Uh, when we can and when we need to, wear a mask. Uh, be a good neighbor. We talk about the city of Buffalo being a city of good neighbors. Well, I'd like to think that Erie County is also the county of good neighbors. Uh, we all can be better at it. And as we go into these fall months and seeing what's happening elsewhere in the United States and across the world, or areas that had dropped down to almost no cases are now exploding again. Uh, we have to do better. We have to be better. It's an inconvenience. We talked about the Halloween safety. I think if you talked last year and you told children that we we're going to cancel Halloween, they would have gone crazy. I don't have kids, so I can't necessarily say, but uh, 
I think this year they may understand it a little bit more than they did in years past because of everything they've had to deal with in the past year. So let's be better. Let's understand that these are inconveniences, but an inconvenience is better than losing a loved one. Uh, and finally, I want to thank Kendra Schmidt from Deaf Access Services for once again providing the American Sign Language to us as uh, she has done on many, many occasions. And I'll open up to questions. I think there was one over here. Mark, what's Allie? Your, what's your opinion of going to trick-or-treating? What do you, what do you advise? Uh, the question was, what's my opinion with regards to going trick-or-treating? I don't have children, so I'm maybe not the most appropriate to say, ask that question to, but uh, my own personal belief is I uh, wouldn't recommend it. My house, which is usually open on Halloween, will not be open. Uh, I, you, you, you walk your neighbors, your neighborhoods, you know what you're doing. Your kids are going and they're getting candy from others and you're wearing masks. But who knows if that person who had the bowl of candy just sneezed in their hand before they handed it. And if they have COVID, you don't know. I mean, this is probably the year to do the alternatives. Marley and Sandra. Uh, so this might be better for Dr. Bursting, but we've gotten word that St. Peter and Paul School in Hamburg, their uh, third and fifth grade class has been sent home to quarantine for 14 days because of a COVID case. Can you speak more on that? They said that it was under guidance from the health department. There are lots of schools that have had potential for COVID cases and uh, quarantine issues. This is just one of them. Thanks. So um, yes, so there, um, you know, were individuals that were um, uh, uh, involved in those two classrooms that were COVID positive. So again, according to our guidance, if there is one person in a class and the class is meeting for over 60 minutes, you know, everybody in the classroom is quarantined. So they are following our recommendations out of, uh, you know, out of uh, an abundance of precaution. And uh, you know we've really been successful with with these guidelines. We haven't had any huge outbreaks in schools. Um, we've really been able to uh, prevent transmission within the schools. By um, by, uh, with schools have been very cooperative, adhering to these guidelines, and it's worked. So um, we're not going to fix it because it's not broken. Which school is that again? Um, it's that with Peter Saint Peter and Paul's in Hamburg. Sandra. Uh, yes, I was curious about um, your uh, mortgage rental assistance program and your child care program. Um, do you have any theories as to why more people aren't applying for this money? And do you think uh, the county and other organizations are doing enough to promote and market the program? And do people simply not know about it? Or are they making, like especially the child care assistance program, are they making the decision to not participate? Uh, the question was, do we have any reasons to believe why more people are not participating in the rental and mortgage assistance program as well as the child care assistance program? And should we be doing more? Well, we think we've done a lot. We've certainly spent a lot of time and effort to get the information out to the public. This is one of those examples, I think, also where you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You can have the program there. You can get as much information out to the public about it. All I'm asking is for our media partners to continue to spread the information on these programs. Uh, I'm, I'm not surprised to see the great response from the business community to the small business program uh, because we are partnering with the Amherst Chamber of Commerce, 43 North. The partnership has been intimately involved. They get the information. They send it out by emails and information to all their members, and those members are applying. Uh, our child care, we're sharing the information with our partners in the child care industry, and they're sharing it. I, once again, I'm not certain if it's a lack of knowledge of the program or people just are like, I don't need the child care. So I don't have to take care of I don't have to enter in the program. Uh, I, I am not surprised to see more people applying for rental than mortgage assistance because the anecdotal information that we had, as well as direct conversations I had with banking leaders were, they did not expect to see the big foreclosure cliff here like they might see in other places. Uh, banks were working with those if they could not pay their mortgage on time to spread the payments out over a longer period or to just roll the dollar amount in uh, to what they owe in the future. So if your mortgage was normally $500, you missed three payments, but you were able to get back in, <clears throat> they take that $1,500 you owe plus the interest and roll it into future payments. So if you still got 20 years left on your mortgage, maybe now it's $510 per month. So the banks were willing to work with uh, a lot of the mortgage folks, uh, the mortgagees or mortgagors, I should say, 
uh, the individuals who mortgage their homes. The rental assistance, we've had a lot of good uh, effort gone out to the landlords. We're seeing a lot of landlords, they can't apply, but we know they're communicating with their tenants to apply. Uh, what I'm fearful of is that some of the like individualized, maybe a duplex, where someone just owns the duplex and they have a tenant, they may not be sharing the information like the landlords who own multiple parcels of property are with their tenants who owe money because the landlords want to get paid. <laughs> so the, the way the program works for the rental assistance is the tenant has to apply, but the landlord receives the funds, and then they agree not to evict. Uh, I, we're, we're continuing to do everything possible. We're talking about having an increased social media campaign. Uh, which I think we've done a pretty good social media campaign, but maybe even advertising on social media with regards to the rental and mortgage assistance program and child care. But there's going to become a point where we're going to have to say, okay, that's it, no more applicants. And if we have so much more money that we need to put into the small business program, well, I'll do that. I just have no choice. We've given, well, we, right now we've given people weeks to apply for these other programs. And remember, the money has to be out the door and spent by the end of this year. So someone can't come to us on December 15th saying, I didn't know about the program. It's going to be too late because the money has to be out the door and spent, not just out the door. So that's an issue. Follow up or? Uh, I'm just trying to recollect the PowerPoint slides. I was wondering how much money actually has already been spent for both the rental mortgage and assistance program. Well, on, on the screen, $2.3 million approximately okay. has been requested for the rental program, some of that has gone out the door, and 87,000 has been requested for the mortgage program out of, out of 102 mortgages, so we're, we're really not talking about a huge amount of money there uh, per mortgage. Do you have similar information for the school uh, child care? Uh, no, it doesn't look like it. No, I wouldn't know. Uh, we, we increased the amount available for our child care subsidy program, and what we have seen is we've seen those who are qualified for the program taking advantage of it that were in the program already. We have not seen as many new people apply. So we, we have used some of the seven million in the child care subsidy assistance. That's not it. That's not uh, to say nothing's been spent. It has, but we thought more people would apply for child care assistance who have not. I'll go to uh, kind of a twofold question. You're concerned about the southern part of western New York. How often do you speak with the leaders down there? And then also with kind of the neighboring states aspect, Pennsylvania, with kind of a spike in cases, how concerned are you? Uh, doctor kind of mentioned already, but with you know, that close coming up here. Uh, twofold question. First was with regards to how often do I speak with our partners in western New York. Uh, we are on a I'm not always on, but most of the time I'm on a conference call at 4 o'clock, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with New York State and the leaders from the other counties in western New York. And uh, the last time we met was on, on Monday. We have a call, conference call later this afternoon. And it was a very, uh, not nasty discussion, but a pointed discussion about the increased cases in the southern part of western New York such that the lieutenant governor was coming into those counties, and she did yesterday, to talk about these issues. Uh, and I, it, I believe it's fair to say that the leaders in these other counties, they're not taking this lightly. Uh, County Executive Wendell in uh, Chautauqua County is very concerned. Uh, uh, Jack Searles in Cattaraugus County is concerned. Kurt Crandall in Allegheny County and others are concerned. Uh, it is important that we realize we're all in this together because there are people who live in these counties that travel in Erie County for family. As, we, as I said earlier, on the conference call I had with uh, the hospital executives yesterday from Kaleida, Catholic Health, and ECMC, uh, while we haven't seen a big uptick of patients from the southern part, there were at least two patients, COVID-19 patients, in our Erie County hospitals that were actually residents of the southern counties. So it's important that we they realize as the numbers go up in the southern tier they have less hospital beds which means they're going to have to send more people to up here and that's a concern now with regards to pennsylvania being having jumped up in its infection rate it is a huge concern the governor talked about earlier today about how our southern tier counties are some of the highest in all of new york state now and if you look at the numbers in the corresponding counties in the northern part of pennsylvania they're very similar because there's a lot of cross-border traffic 
There's people that have family in Bradford that then drive up uh, into Red House and Allegheny, and you, you, you got back and forth all over the place. People work in, in Cattaraugus County, and they may uh, live in Erie County, PA, or Potter County, PA. So, I mean, it's, it's a concern. And the governor pretty much announced they're not shutting down the border. They're not going to have state troopers p uh, positioned on every road, which would be pretty damn near impossible if you think about all the road crossings between New York State and Pennsylvania. There's a lot. Uh, so people just need to, as was noted, uh, try to avoid all unnecessary travel to these states. Uh, it's, it's concerning. And it doesn't, I mean, we watched it earlier this year with regards to the cases in Erie County in New York State, where we were kind of one of the last ones in New York State to get it. And you could see the, the new cases just sort of pop up going down the thruway. And you'd have Westchester County, then New York City, and up to Albany County, and then across to Onondaga County, then Monroe County, and then we're waiting when we're going to get our case, and we got our cases. And all it takes, you know, is because people are constantly traveling. So it is a concern. And uh, uh, I have been in contact with Kathy Dahlkemper, the county executive of Erie County, Pennsylvania. Uh, in the past, uh, their caseloads were lower. Uh, all of Pennsylvania is increasing. Uh, Erie County PA is kind of in some ways like Erie County, New York is. Uh, we're doing better than the surrounding rural counties when it comes to new case infection rates and hospitalizations. So it's, it's a concern that's going to continue as we, can, as we move further into these fall months. I'll go uh, over here. Kelly hadn't asked a question yet. I know it's up to the state, but people keep asking us, is Cuomo going to come? I've got no answer on the bills. Okay. Can I just, they wanted me to ask. Uh, as I said, foreseeable future. As the numbers go up, I think we realize if they weren't allowing it when the numbers are lower. The other thing to remember, too, is that it's not just Erie County residents that go to football games. It's all over. So, okay. I, but I've heard it, I don't anticipate any change in the near future. Are you concerned that any of those cluster zones with the colors like we're seeing downstate, that any of our southern tier counties could end up being on that list? The question is, am I concerned about any of our southern tier counties being on the cluster list? And the answer is yes because two of the closest counties to them are on the cluster list now, Shemung and Steuben. Uh, yeah. I'm glad Erie County's not. I can only control certain aspects in Erie County. I can voice my opinion with regards to the other counties, and, and I'm, uh, as I say, those other counties are concerned themselves. They don't want to go on the cluster list. I've talked to uh, a couple business leaders who are based in Buffalo, but have operations in the southern part of uh, New York State, in one of, a couple of them in those those counties, and they're concerned because they don't want to see their business have to get shut down because of a cluster in, in their zip code in Cattaraugus County or Chautauqua County. Uh, and they also have a lot of people going back and forth between operations in Erie County and those in Allegheny County, so it's a concern. I'll come back to them. I know when the issue first came up that the governor was planning on touring, that you had said that uh, engineers here have the maps of the stadium, they can do it. The guys might as well stop reporting about the bills until something happens. It's like people asking the weatherman, is it going to rain tomorrow? Oh, well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't have anything else to add. It's it's a small portion of the population. It's a very vocal portion of the population, but it's a small portion of the population. And uh, that's what it comes down to. There's always going to be people who are critical of it. All I got to do is look at my social media, and uh, which I mute a lot of these people, so I don't even see it, which just tells me they're wasting their time posting, trying to agitate me when I don't even see most of their posts. <laughs> but uh, there's a very vocal group that's angry out there uh, who are spreading lies, too. Hey, it's part of the business we're in, but all you got to do is look at what's happening around the rest of the country and seeing the numbers increasing. Uh, actually, I was in contact with yesterday somebody in the Dallas, Texas area because they've got individuals going to football games and baseball games down there, and I asked them have they had any reports of individuals who were at the games who were sick, and, and the response is they didn't know because that information wasn't being shared. There might be. There may have been people who went to a – Cowboys game or one of the recent baseball games who was sick, but they're not sharing that information down there, which is pretty sad, actually. Nate, you had a question. 
you know, obviously we know well, about the uh, small business program, the child education. There was a lot of categories for the CARES Act money that could have been applied, one of them being broadband. I'm just curious the decision-making process of not applying some of those funds to do at least a portion of Erie Net. I know last week you announced. We found out the question was with regards to broadband. Uh, could we use CARES Act funding? And the answer was no, not for a permanent. We've already received that from the Treasury. The only thing we could have theoretically done was buy, like, MIFIs which then would have to hook into and we'd have to pay for the MIFI anyway. Uh, it could only be used for a temporary basis, but a permanent uh, internet broadband could not be done. It's actually the number one priority of the National Association of Counties President, Gary Moore, a friend of mine from uh, Boone County, Kentucky. Uh, his number one priority item is broadband, and he's been pushing the, through Mitch McConnell to change the regs so that they could use CARES Act funding, and the answer we've continually got back is no. You could buy a MIFI, you could give it to a family, but you couldn't do anything else, and then the CARES Act funding runs out effective on December 30th, so they got a MIFI that would be useless because then you got to pay for the constant uh, costs associated. So we did look at it, but the answer was we could not spend it. Sandra? I, I had a couple of questions for the health commissioner about um, the phone number for several questions. One of them, the phone number for calling restaurants reporting restaurants and large gatherings, is that right? Is that the same number? So it's irregardless, I mean, if it's just like, say, like a house of worship or something, if it's a large gathering, it would still apply that phone number, the 6800? Yes. Yes, the phone number is all the same. Large restaurants. Okay. Um, and then I was curious to know whether or not the um, standards for finding or closing businesses has changed over time, or is it, has it always, been, has it been the same? Because there were a number of restaurants, uh, that were fined or closed over the summer months, but it doesn't seem like we've seen as much of that recently, and I didn't know if there had been any kind of adjustment in that regard. The, well, the, the question was with regards to finding and closing businesses. First off, it was, is the number the same for businesses, gyms? If you want to uh, complain about or file a complaint about a particular entity, the number is the same. It's on the screen right now. 716-961-6800. It goes to our Department of Health sanitarian unit uh, and then in, when it comes to the are we treating people or businesses differently especially restaurants the answer is no we're just seeing more compliance with restaurants now uh, early on we were shutting down restaurants that were violating the state's order not to operate like they couldn't have in service dining or drinking and people were doing that so we shut down bars and restaurants that were having in service food or drink uh, and, and there were a few of them, not a lot. Uh, we started then to get, uh, when they started reopening, we started seeing issues with uh, they're not following the rules with regards to mask wearing of their staff, mask wearing of po folks, just gathering around and drinking without food. We have to enforce the rules. The rules say that that's a no-no. We enforce those rules. The one thing I will say is I get the reports on the, the visits that they go out, and we're getting a lot more satisfactory, 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 no problem, satisfactory, satisfactory. And then if there is an issue, the first thing we try to do is give them a warning. We do not, we, we've given hundreds of warnings as compared to actual violations. The violations have to be egregious to get to a point where it's a first visit and they're getting fined. Usually they're getting a warning. Sometimes they're getting a second warning before they get fined. Uh, the one thing we've seen is uh, much more uh, businesses just following the rules, which is a good thing. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, sure. And, um, thank Gotta you. say it at the mic. Thanks. And then you know, remember that um, we are complying with, we're enforcing New York Forwards regulations. And so those have been changing throughout the year. We went from you know phase zero to now we're in phase four. So the rules and regulations for restaurants would change with each phase. So while we were treating each restaurant the same um, in each of the phase where uh, we were in. We were expecting every restaurant and business to comply with whatever phase we were in, but that was different. You know, um, you know several months ago, we were um, you know, in phase one and two, and the rules were different than we are now in phase four. So for businesses, you have obviously, there are hundreds more businesses that are getting violent, that are technically violating the rules, but they're not getting fined. And so I'm just, I'm just curious to know, is like, if employees weren't wearing masks, in June, um, was the same standard for like finding them the same as it would be like now if, if employees aren't wearing masks 
Right, right, and we, I mean, um, so the question is, are we applying the same standards for all the businesses? And we are. I mean, you know, again, um, just have um, when um, employees don't wear masks, that's like one piece of the puzzle. So that's like just, you know, one, um, one um, uh, behavior that they're not complying with. But we look at, you know, the, the entire situation. We look at, uh, if, you know, they're washing hands and, I mean, you know, de you know depending on what type of business it is. Um, you know, we, we inspect mostly um, restaurants and bars now and then also fitness centers. And, um, and you know, we, um, you know, the, um, masking and social distancing and, um, you know, screening for illness and number of people, I mean, we take that all into account when, um, when we issue violations. So it's just not like just one, you know, one particular entity and in, in individual. So if it's just, a, I'm sorry, just one last thing. If it's a one-time event, let's say it was a wedding or something, obviously that's not going to be a repeat occurrence. So how do you evaluate what happens in that situation like well, that? So the question is, how do we evaluate a wedding? Um, it uh, right. The, I mean, the wedding itself is um, um, is at a venue, right? And so it's the venue can hold multiple weddings. So the really the violation and and if we have to issue a fine or a close order, um, it would be against the facility that is hosting the the gathering, not against the um, you know the, the family or the you know the people that are celebrating. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm just wondering, do you impose a fine then, or would you say, well, that's just a warning for you, and so the next time you host a big wedding, we'll fine you? Well, you know, again, it, um, so the question is, you know, do we give, uh, you know, a fine or, uh, you know, a violation? I mean, you know, again, um, initially we, you know, we, um, our, we give them a warning, I mean, maybe um, over the, you know, try, first we initially, uh, with ev with every complaint we receive, first we'll call to investigate, we'll find out, you know, what they're doing, and um, you know what they have plans, what their policies are, and uh, if you know they don't have, if they're not limit, say for a, like a, a place that hosts a weddings, a venue that hosts weddings, if they don't uh, limit the number of people attending, we'll advise them of what the the executive orders are, the regulations, or and we will ask them to you know change policy, and then we would follow up with a visit, and after we had you know instructed them what the policies were, what the regulations were, and they were still in non-compliance, then you know depending on how egregious the um, you know the violations were if there were you know hundreds of people nobody was wearing a mask um, that would be one thing instead of like there's ten people over and most people were wearing masks would be, that would be a different situation so you know again we take it in you know case by case account and really we want we want people to be able to celebrate we want people to be able to do as much as they can as long as they would adhere to the executive order and so we're just enforcing the executive order and, and helping them get there and unfortunately sometimes Sometimes it might take uh, a fine or a closure if they refuse to listen to us after you know multiple uh, multiple touches. Sure. Just in some ways, it's no different than what the public health department's done for years, in which they'll come out and give violations. They may, if it continues, they do a spot check two weeks later, uh, and find out that the same condition exists, like saw a rat or a mouse or you didn't keep the, the food in the uh, cooler at the proper temperature, and you could, we eventually have gotten to a point where significant fines and shutdowns. Uh, so it's not just like COVID-related complaints that were often result in a restaurant being dinged. It can be just they are not following the public health sanitary laws. Uh, or they, if it's another non-restaurant business, they're not following the rules that are in place, whatever it might be. Bowling alleys. Bowling alleys can open to a certain portion now. Uh, movie theaters are going to be allowed to open on Friday. However, they have to follow the rules that are in place. Our health inspectors have to go out because they serve food in bowling alleys. They serve food in movie theaters to make certain they're following the rules. And if they go out and they find a movie theater is open and it's 100% full with people, they're going to get shut down because they're not following the rules. It's not because we're treating them any differently than anyone else, it's because they're just not following the rules. So when someone gets shut down, a business gets shut down, it's egregious. Uh, they've done something really bad, regardless of whether it is in a COVID period or the pre-COVID period. And there have been situations where we've shut down restaurants and other businesses in the past pre-COVID because of something that was egregious. Uh, a few more questions. 
Do you have a response for the controller calling for businesses to be refunded that got violations? Uh, the, the controller, uh, I, you know, I, I was the controller. I understand the responsibility of the controller. He doesn't seem to know what it is, but such be it. There's some good people down in the controller's office. Uh, if, a, if a business got fined, they deserved it. And I, I, if I was, I actually do know that one of the restaurateurs was very upset that their name was in the paper again uh, because they felt like the controller actually is causing them a disservice and hurting them, hurting their business because now it's being brought up again that they weren't following the rules a couple months ago. So the controller, if you follow his social media, he seems intent on uh, just going after me. I mean, if he really was that interested, he should have run for county executive, but it didn't seem like he had the guts to do it. One, any more questions? If not, uh, I want to thank everybody. Be safe and well. There's, uh, there's still COVID-19 in the community. There's still COVID-19 across our country. We need to do what's right to protect our fellow neighbors, our family members. Wear a mask when you can't safely socially distance. Uh, wash your hands. Uh, be good. Go Dodgers. One down, three more to go. It's been 32 years. I hope this is the year. Take care, everyone.